Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this session on, on listening and social acoustics. Uh, my name is Corinna da fonseca Walheim. Um, I feel a little sheepish and, and even embarrassed. I, I feel like I'm appearing slightly under false pretenses today, and it's not only because of the haircut. Um, <laughs> what a difference a pandemic makes. Um, <laughs> but like many writers here, you know, the invitation came a, a good couple of years ago, and then of course the festival had to be postponed, not, not once, but twice. Um, and in that time, not just my hairstyle changed, but, um, but to a certain degree also my role in the music world, where I went from you know, really being um, a, a, a full-time music critic, although a freelance one for the New York Times for many years, reviewing sometimes as many as 100 concerts a year, to um, transitioning out of that role into ways of writing and speaking about music that feel more personal and a little more creative. Um, and I also started a, um, I call it a concert series, but it's really a program. Welcome, just come on in. Come and sit as close as you like, as you feel comfortable, please. Um, a program that brings people into more intimate relationship with, with sounds, with music, but also maybe themselves uh, by bringing together meditation and live music. Um, that's a program called Beginner's Ear. So, you know, when I speak about the art and the craft of, of a music critic and what a music critic might be able to teach us about listening, I do look at that craft increasingly through the rear mirror. Um, but I also find more and more that, um, that there are certain lessons that might be transferable um, when it comes to helping us become better listeners. Um, and I do think that many of us feel that listening is um, an imperiled and increasingly impoverished skill in a world where we deal with digital overwhelm and political <laughs> noise of all kinds. Um, and it can sometimes feel like we're all talking past each other. Um, I should add that this festival has actually really given me hope in that sense because not only am I so moved and, and inspired by all the amazing speakers and panels, but I'm actually really moved by you guys. And like I've sat amongst my audiences these past three days as well. Um, and there is something very special about carving out time to sit still and very few of you get to ask questions and to just listen um, to the people we love to read. And I think that's a really wonderful thing. And so I, I thank the festival and everyone who makes it possible, really also for kind of nurturing and cultivating uh, a festival of listening here in Rancho Mirage. Um, but so I thought that I would use the next 30 minutes or so um, to maybe offer four kind of principles that might go towards becoming better listeners that are drawn from my experience as a critic and uh, curating concerts. So initially this talk was going to be called The Art of Listening, and then I thought that sounded really hubristic, and I was worried that you know I was over-promising something. But it also kind of felt untrue because I think that there are, instinctively we know this, there are different modes of listening. Um, and in music too, each type of music kind of teaches us how to listen to it. Um, so there isn't one art of listening, but there are really different practices and, and cultures of listening. Um, I think we all, in our relationship with, even with recorded music, we know that you know, we sometimes reach for music to pump our heart rate up at the gym. You know, we might look for music to help us mourn in community. We might look for music to get us to dance. You know, we get music to add dignity to certain life events, whether it's a marriage or a graduation, unthinkable without music. Um, and we sometimes listen to music, you know, to heal a broken heart, or sometimes, you know, just to actually relive the strangely pleasurable ache of the breaking heart, you know, which is a sort of, it's something we can barely explain to ourselves, but, you know, people like Adele have tapped into <laughs> very profitably. Um, and so I think the first thing I would just offer is that good listening to begin with is flexible listening. Um, that there are different, different ways of, of responding to different kinds of music. And in the live sphere, you know, I think every genre um, and every culture has sort of its own listening conventions as well. So if you think that in classical music, 
where the sounds are acoustic, um, they're often very fragile. There is a huge dynamic range, unlike any other musical culture. Symphonic music can go from you know, the whisper tiny to the brass section going full tilt. Um, there is a certain, there is a, a culture of protecting the silences around the music which translate into sort of injunctions on not clapping and between movements, which to a newcomer can feel really stuffy, but you could also think of it as really just sort of the audience coming together in this kind of protective embrace around these very vulnerable and fragile sounds. So that's in classical music. But meanwhile, in jazz, like you, any jazz fan who's sort of worth their salt will, you know, will not let a good solo go by without sort of a throaty, yeah you know, and like maybe a little clapping. But like these things are sort of as individualistic as the music making, right? They're not coordinated. It's like people sort of, they're like, I heard you, man, that was awesome, right? And it's like, that's jazz. Um, meanwhile, in rock music, where the sound system is so powerful that your individual kind of audience behavior really, like there's not much you can do to ruin a rock concert, right? Like you could sort of, bang pots and pans and belt out the Marseillaise and nobody would know about it. But there is sort of this, the way the audience kind of responds to is, is really in a physical kind of synchronicity of bodies that are dancing and jumping and waving their arms, um, or at least should be. Um, because I, so I took myself to, do any of you know who Monoskin is? Monoskin, Italian glam rock bands who are sort of taking the world by storm, yes. Um, I'm a huge fan, and so I went to see them uh, live in, in Manhattan in early December. And it was a really interesting experience, not only because it took me a while to sort of get over the lack of cigarette smoke, you know, <laughs> sort of dating myself. I was like, it doesn't feel like a rock concert. But, you know, they, like, this is a band that not only do they master their instruments, but they really know how to play with the audience, too. And so they put on a great show, and the singer is so charismatic. And he will, at certain moments, he will sort of tell the audience, you know, to get to like, jump, jump, jump. And so I was, you know, ever being the uh, over overachieving listener, <laughs> yeah, I was like pumping up and down in the air. But I noticed all these millennials around me who sort of stood there, like legs akimbo with their cell phones steady, you know, as if it was their job and mission in life to capture like the unshaken footage of the Monoskin concert. And I had this funny realization, which was that I think rock music needs Gen Xers like me. Um, and you know, while in the classical music world, there is all this anxiety over the graying of audiences, that there are too many old people, and that you know, if, if classical music can't win over the young ones, it's gonna die. I was sort of left thinking you know, that if rock music is left in the hands of the Gen Zers, and they're sort of Instagramming their way through a live experience. I think that's when rock and roll dies, but that's just my thought. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what I'm sort of getting at by just sketching out these different examples is that in a live concert, there is this chemical reaction between the performer and the listener. And it, it, it means that the listener really makes a difference. Um, this chemical reaction is, you know, it's sort of a little different depending on the venue, depending on the music. But the first sort of principle, I think, of becoming good listeners is to just be aware of your responsibility in the concert hall. Um, and so when, when I present um, beginner's ear sessions where I have a little a, a short introduction, a little curated silence, a sort of guided meditation, and then live music, I sort of begin by telling audiences that listening is really not, um, it's not a passive act at all. It's not something where you shut up and quiet in your body as much as you can, but it's really a co-creative act that is you know, built on generosity um, because it, it can be uncomfortable to sort of still your, your jitters, your body, your, your cough, you know, if it's, if it's in a really quiet classical setting. So it, comes, it takes a certain generosity and patience and stillness and focus. And those things can be hard, but they're worth it because through that sort of, that collective um, s attentive stillness, the, the, cr the conditions are created out of which music can grow and flourish. And that's a really powerful thing. So the first thing I think is to just sort of remember that 
um, that as listeners, we, we are as much part of the performance as the musicians are. And again, sort of stepping out of maybe the classical scene, if you think of a jazz musician like Keith Jarrett, who, you know, some of his greatest work um, and the work that he most prized, I think, were the solo, fully improvised um, solo piano shows. Um, he, those records are the products of tours, and there are many concerts which don't make it on record, right? But they're the ones where he goes on stage not knowing what he's going to play, but there's something that happens in that room in conjunction with the audience that brings out something he didn't know he had in him and that makes it onto a record, which we can then enjoy for years and years. Um, so in, in that kind of setting, you would, you would really want to go into the concert to be the best audience possible so that they play their best. Um, you know, when, when I think about listening, I sometimes sort of look up the, the research and, and the, the science, and I'm struck by how psychology emphasizes studies on listening that measure retention. So, you know, you sort of set up some kind of experiment where people have to listen to somebody talk and then you basically test them afterwards how much they remember. Um, but I think that that actually misses like a really big part of listening, which is, you know, it's not about retaining as much as possible. Like you're actually also, you're also encouraging and shaping the message that's being delivered through the quality of your listening. Um, and so I want to share a story with you that came out of, um, the work that I did, unfortunately very briefly because the pandemic shut it down um, at a federal prison in Brooklyn um, in early 2020, where I, um, I did a couple of sessions on the men's side um, and then one day had the incredible pleasure of going into the women's side uh, accompanied by one amazing violinist, Johnny Gandelsman. He's a member of Brooklyn Rider String Quartet, really wonderful musician. Um, and you know, here was an audience that I, I couldn't assume knew anything about classical music or cared about Bach. But when I, when I sort of sat with them, first of all, we, we sort of pulled up chairs in a circle. It was a strange experience on the women's side because you have to sort of walk through the dormitories to get to the common room. And so it very much felt like an extension of their living space, whereas the men were sort of corralled into like a library or this chapel space. But um, I was also really struck by how these women were incredibly attuned to each other. Like they were very protective of each other. You could sort of sense that there was a sense of this one was going to translate for her friend who didn't speak English, and this one was going to make sure that she was sitting in the right place. And but so when I spoke to them, I sort of I, I tried to say, you know, when we all think of listening, we can probably all bring to mind somebody in our lives who's a really good listener. Um, somebody who, when we have something important to say, or maybe even an idea to sort of wander out loud in our heads, um, or an idea to bounce off of, would be the perfect sounding board. Um, and there might be different things we prize in that person, but roughly speaking, there's probably going to be a certain amount of focus. They're probably not going to be fiddling on their phone while we talk to them. Um, they're probably going to be patient enough to hold back until we've said our piece and not jump in with solutions or um, judgment. And so as I was saying this, I could sort of hear, you know, I could sort of see heads nodding. I was like, yeah, yeah, it's so, right, they're good, better listeners than bad listeners. And I said, you know, if, if you imagine, if you were to sort of, not only would the good listener remember more of what you told them that day, but you probably find yourself saying things you wouldn't have said in the presence of the ideal listener. Like you might take emotional risks, you might find creative leaps that you hadn't thought of in yourself. Um, you might sort of dig deeper into some painful memory and actually come to some clarity. I mean, that's the power of a good listener. Um, and so, you know, I was sort of suggesting like if, if we could do the same thing in music, you know, musicians will talk about how they play their best in certain moments when they really feel that the, the audience is kind of embracing and holding and resonating with them, then that, that is sort of the, that perfect chemistry. And so what I sort of offered is like, why don't we all see if we can just get Johnny here to play the best he's ever played, you know? Um, and then we sort of shared a little silence and he played and it was, 
one of the most extraordinary Bach audiences I've ever been a member of. It was, it felt fresh, it felt vital, it felt like sharing and, you know, everybody was so connected to it afterwards and, um, and we had some really beautiful conversation afterwards. So that, that is sort of the, the, the power of what I've, I've come to think of as social acoustics, right? When, when you think like about, you know, musicians don't want to play in a crappy hall like certain things will make the acoustics bad, the materials will be bad, you know, or too many flat surfaces, you know, it's good to have small points of refraction, that's why like old Baroque churches are wonderful with all the decorations. Um, but I think socially too, we basically create acoustics that can increase the resonance of, of any message. And that is as true in music as it is um, in social conversations. So if, if if one quality of good listening is that sort of uh, sense of focus, the other one I want to throw out is that the idea that every now and then it might be actually worth dividing your attention. So what do I mean by that? Um, the, the, the second principle that I think comes into good listening is awareness. Um, awareness of your own inner state, every, as, bit, every bit as much as of your environment. So. When I, when I used to go to concerts, um, I very often went by myself, even though I always had two great seats. And you, know, you sort of settle in, and all around you, people are still chatting. And, um, and then the lights dim, and the oboe plays the A, and everybody tunes. And, um, and there was sort of this palpable sense of what I sort of call like mental static in the room for a good five, 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of a busy concert in New York City. Because everybody's sort of bringing in their day with them and everything that has happened, the stress of the subway, sort of still clinging to people. And you can almost, you can almost hear it as clearly as that plastic bag that's like rustling between the feet of the person in front of you. Um, and so just bringing awareness to, to that inner chatter can, can help them still it. Um, I think that um, a lot of discomfort actually gets in the way of good listening, and I think that concert halls and presenters who want to educate their audiences to be better listeners would do well to think about physical comfort. For example, these chairs are great, right? Like they have good back support and they're padded. So a lot of concert halls have like insanely uncomfortable, like these folding seats where like this, your lumbar is like, it's, you know, it's, it, adds to, it adds to the discomfort. Um, and there's the social discomfort of people, especially in classical music, feeling like they are inadequate, that the person next to them knows more and therefore hears more and therefore enjoys it more than they do. And I think the, um, the answer that classical music, for the most part, has sort of given to this problem is that they offer pre-concert lectures where you're sort of pumped up with, with information, often biographical information, in order to sort of arm the listener with as much knowledge as possible and before you send them out into the experience. So I would make a case for actually disarming the listener and bringing people to a state of not knowing at the beginning of a concert. I love to have no program at all for a concert because it, first of all, it establishes an expectation of trust in the listener and so then you don't know what you're going to hear, and so you're already just somehow left to activate the curiosity gene and that sort of generous spirit of, okay, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's see. Um, I also, from meditating, became fascinated with a practice that is part of Buddhist meditation that plays with feeling tones, where if you're sort of aware of your awareness and you have your thoughts just chattering away while you're trying to still your mind to actually address each thought and sort of just be aware whether it's a positive one or a negative one or neutral. There's really only the three kind of attitudes we have towards anything in our lives, whether it's a sound, a sensation, or an idea. It's like it's either pleasant or it's unpleasant or we tune out. And so what I mean by dividing your attention is to sometimes acknowledge that while we're trying to focus on what somebody's saying or what somebody's playing, that there is a kind of second voice that's playing in our head or there is an itch in our foot or we are hungry. 
And you know, instead of trying to suppress it, to just gently direct our attention towards it for a moment, to sort of just say, I see you, <laughs> like, oh, I'm hungry, and then go back to the main object of our attention. It sounds so simple, but it's a bit like trying to have a conversation with your girlfriend when your toddler is sort of screaming for snacks. You know, at some point, you're going to have to just turn <laughs> towards the toddler you know, and bring out the Cheerios. Um, so I, I also thought I would just like offer you one little like takeaway um, exercise that I think is really fun for awareness, um, which is best done outdoors actually, but just to sort of play with auditory awareness, where you can try and identify one sound that is mechanical. It's like here we have the air filtration system right now. Um, you could have one that's organic. If you were outside, maybe you'd have the wind or you'd have some birds. Um, and then maybe one sound that you are making, that you're emitting, which is maybe just your breath or maybe your footsteps or maybe the way you, your clothes kind of rub, rustle, you know, or your handbag rubs against your jeans when you're walking. Um, and to just sort of identify these three different categories of sound. And it can be fun to sort of work with bringing, I mean, you could do it now with my voice as the natural one. You could try and find your own breath or your own I don't know if you're crossing your legs, like sort of the rustle of your pants, you know? Um, and we have the air filtration. And you can choose which one to foreground. It's one of the great powers of listening is that we don't have, eye, we don't have ear lids that can tune out auditory stimulation, but we can choose what to foreground. And it's a powerful skill that, you know, helps us survive. But you can make that air filtration thing the main show right now or you could actually really hone in to your own breath if you can just about catch it. And then if you've played with those three different focal planes, you could just kind of let go and let them all weave together in this po kind of polyphonic score. And it's a lot of fun to do on the New York subway or it's, you can do it on a morning walk. Um, but yeah, I would encourage you to play with it. And it also becomes interesting if you start thinking about what is a natural sound? On the one hand, okay, rain. Rain is natural. But rain sounds the way it does depending on what it's hitting, right? So rain in the canyons of Manhattan does not sound the same as, as on a tin roof or on a grassy field. And the wind in poplar trees sounds very different than in aspen trees, right? Or howling through some concrete building like around the corner of, of, of some skyscraper. So it can be fun to sort of investigate what actually is the cause of what we're hearing. And then also, you know, it sort of leads you to a place of interconnectedness that can actually be kind of delicious. So um, as we're moving into the sort of esoteric thing, I wanted to offer the, the, the third little exercise, which is to be a good listener, it's really worth engaging with silence. So in the musical world, famously, John Cage did this when he presented a comp composition called Four Minutes, 33 Seconds, which was premiered on a grand piano at a, a music festival where um, the pianist sat down at the piano, assumed the position of playing, and then didn't move and didn't produce a sound, and then actually paused, because the piece is in three movements, <laughs> paused, sort of lowered his hands, did it again and, and did so a third time. And so famously at the premiere, you know, people were outraged, people felt they were being made fun of, um, it was an affront, it was a provocation. Um, the first, first and so far only time I got to experience a performance of it um, was at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City a few years ago where it was part of a program that was also connected to uh, Rauschenberg and sort of certain visual artists who played with you know, white canvases and, um, and sort of absence and emptiness. Um, and so I got to see it with a violinist, who, uh, Todd Reynolds, who I couldn't help noticing before he came on stage, actually tuned his instrument. <laughs> Which I thought was like, like method acting, like, right? Like, I mean, he tuned it and then he came on stage and he sort of had one pose and he held it and he put it down. And then for the next one, he was dif a different spot on the, on the bow. Um, and of course, this being you know a, a post two thousand year two thousand 
Manhattan art audiences, everybody behaved impeccably. Um, but I will tell you that I have vivid memories of what I heard in those four minutes and 33 seconds. I remember the mechanical whooshes. I remember the sort of gastric gurgles of my neighbor you know, <laughs> who's digesting their dinner. Um, and silly though it seems, you know, there is something about listening to silence that really heightens the power of perception. And it really does tie into meditation in the sense that, you know, in meditation you use awareness, you turn awareness onto awareness itself. So you just try to be aware of what you're aware of. It's one of the biggest misperceptions about meditation. It's about emptying your mind. It's actually just about noticing with equanimity what's passing through it. But so when you, when you, when silence, when, when a sound context pulls you into silence, and especially when it's a musical one, it sort of draws the ear onto itself in a way that can be really, really special. And of course, we, we listen to silence. We know how to listen to silence in social settings really well. I mean, we all know the difference between, you know, a comic beat before a punchline or, you know, the pregnant pause, um, or, you know, the expectant hush, you know, as, as sort of, you know, somebody clinks a glass and, you know, a speech is about to happen. And, and the reason these, these gaps in sound or in these gaps in social noise have meaning is entirely a function of what comes before and what comes after. And so this is absolutely the same in music. And John Cage was by far not the first person to play with this. So, I mean, in Beethoven's Fifth Symphony actually begins with a rest. Like, the first note you hear is on the second, eighth note. Um, and the whole quality of that symphony, of that movement, that sort of frenetic f energy comes from the fact that the music is already behind by the time it's out of the gate. Like, there's a gap, it's off, and it's like, it's just off kilter. And it's incredibly exciting. Um, and Haydn was a great master of comic silences. He sometimes has like the most simple little sweet movements. There is something is repeated. It's like he's teaching you the joke. You, you know how it's going to go. And then there's like a slightly longer silence than the one before. And it's like, made you wait for it, didn't I? You know, and it's absolutely charming. And at the very, very beginning of, um, of opera, when, when Claudio Monteverdi wrote the first opera that we know of, L'Orfeo, which is also about the origin myth of, um, of the power of music, of music being able to bring people possibly even back to life. Um, there was this prologue in which the allegory of music sings um, about her power. And she has this line, you know, she's just one voice and a very delicate accompaniment with the orbo and sort of this old kind of lute-like. And she says, not even the birds shall sing, you know, when in my dominion. And then Monteverdi has this rest and it draws you in and it's a little bit like you know a cartoon character sort of running off a cliff right and you just suddenly realize like there's nothing below you and the ear suddenly hears itself listening and at that moment it's like are you in the dominion of silence or are you in the power of music like who is sort of holding you in thrall it's a really profound and wonderful aspect of how we can play with silence. So to build a listening muscle, I think it's really worth listening to nothing every once in a while, um, as often as possible, and to stay there long enough for, even for boredom, to kind of, you know, maybe tip into transcendence or just curiosity. So then the fourth fi and final principle that I just wanted to offer is that we said we should engage with silence, should definitely also engage with noise. So when I was a music critic, um, I covered everything from grand opera to experimental new music. Um, and it was two, three, four times a, a week that I would go to concerts, operas, you'd have to listen, you'd have to write about it the next morning. Um, and it was a pretty intense sort of metabolism for all these different sounds. And needless to say, not only are there things that you know better than others, but there are going to be things you don't already like. There will be some things you don't like. Um, strange things. I mean, I remember having to review a, a, a performance for a recorded vacuum cleaner sounds. <laughs> that, was, um, that was actually really fun. I, I, yeah, I, I got to play around in my lead about how vacuum cleaners were useful 
what did I say? Like to still, like their, their roar was long been known to be useful to still like fussy babies, but when it came to making music, vacuum cleaners mostly had to suck it up and wait. Um, <laughs> um, I also once reviewed um, a performance of Lou Reed's Metal Machine music uh, arranged for cha Amplified Chamber Orchestra, where they had sort of stuck microphones into the bells of the wind instruments in order to render the shrieking overtones from the feedback on the original electric guitar album. So when, when you engage with all of these different things, you have to, you, you sort of, you get a chance to really develop that flexibility of listening where you have to bring generosity and curiosity um, and a certain stamina sometimes, if it's a six hour Wagner boss, two very different kinds of music. Um, so it, it does help to get paid, obviously. Um, it also helps if you're married to um, a political writer who has different opinions, who asks you to critique his columns, that you get very good at just critiquing the craft without having to like <laughs> and endorse everything in it. Um, but you know, when I think about sort of the moments that, that have helped uh, sort of open your ear to something you didn't think you wanted or needed to listen to. Um, it strikes me that very often it comes from personal connections. And if any of you were in, in the chat I just had with Teddy Abrams in, in the other room, you know, he speaks so powerfully about how the best way to get people to connect to music is a personal connection, if you even think you have a personal connection. Um, but I remember one time, and I was very, very new in journalism, and I was interviewing Zubin Mehta um, in Israel at, at his office in, in Tel Aviv. Uh, he's very charming. I was nine months pregnant with my first child, and he kept trying to feed me huge portions of chocolate cake. Um, and on a TV, like his, his attention kept sort of darting to the TV. There was a cricket match being broadcast, because being Indian-born, he is obsessed with critic, cr cricket. And so I said to him, I said, you know, I, cricket to me is like Wagner. Like people just stand around for hours and nothing happens. <laughs> and I remember thinking that was a really clever thing to say because I just, I had my issues with Wagner. And without missing a beat, he said, that just shows that you don't understand Wagner as well as not understanding cricket. He says, cricket is like Bach. It's full of complexity and drama. And so I, I was sort of chastened and, you know, it, and, and did actually, in a different context, have a sort of aha moment with Wagner where, and I'd listened to a bunch of operas of his. My parents always had subscription tickets to the opera. And, but I'd grown up on Mozart and Verdi operas. And I was listening for that kind of texture where a voice is sort of just soaring above the orchestral accompaniment. And I just found Wagner so impenetrable and murky. I, murky was sort of, that I just couldn't get to, I couldn't connect with especially with the voice. And then one time I got three hours into Tristan and Isolde, I just sort of had suddenly this, so it was almost like somebody had sort of turned the lens of my sort of focal point. I just sort of realized that these voices weren't soaring, they were swimming, like they were submerged in the texture and they weren't meant to stick out. They were like in this, this kind of web of sound. Um, and it was sort of this moment that, like, you know, it didn't make me the biggest fan of Wagner, but, but I now know how to listen to it. Um, I also just I have to just give a shout out to my, my beloved dad who passed away almost two years ago. Um, I remember I was in my early 20s. We were at a, a, a fancy dinner, relatively rare for us in, in Brussels where I grew up. Um, and there was this white wine. And, my, and, you know, I'd been drinking lots of wine at that point. And at some point, my father said, what do you think of the wine? And I said, it doesn't taste of much. I don't, it doesn't really taste of anything. And my father said, you know, there's expressionist painting, and there's impressionist painting, and just because the colors aren't as strong, doesn't make, you know, he had some way of saying it, just framing it as painting, and I just had a little moment of going, oh, okay. I'm drinking an impressionist dry white wine, okay. Um, so, you know, maybe the obvious suggestion is, you know, to be a more adventurous and flexible listener is to, First of all, just find people who can kind of take you by the hand and, you know, and ask somebody, like, what do you love that I don't already know? And what do you love about it? You know, we do listen in bubbles so much. It's, and it's becoming easier and easier for us to listen in bubbles. Um, radio stations are sort of genre-specific. Artificial intelligence has now 
made Spotify incredibly well attuned to our preferences and keep sort of slipping us a new song that sounds like the one we listened to on repeat for two weeks in August. And, and it's a little creepy because it's often pretty accurate. Um, and we, we, we sort of live in these, these bubbles where we just sort of reinforce our preferences and our tastes. And I can understand people saying, well, what's wrong with that? I like what I like. You know, why, why should I listen to this? I mean, it's not like music is food, right? It's not like we need a diverse, balanced diet to be healthy. I mean, like nobody's going to, you know, develop an ulcer because they listen to too much pop or, you know, Wagner. <laughs> but if you translated that idea into the political realm, you know, then, then we do have a problem because, because, yes, I mean, we have our preferences not just for opinions and content, but also sort of the delivery of news. You know, some people like, you know, high energy harangues on the radio and some people need to have sort of plummy toned, you know, measured, considerate um, interviews. And some people need to have it in, you know, in crisp print on, on their newspaper. And some people need to have it with a side of snark and, and a bit of live music as, as a comedy show. Um, and there is something that I think most of us really feel is that, that being allowed to just listen to what we already love, it just separates us from, from other people. So I think, you know, listening, the listening that we, that we most benefit from is gonna be adventurous. Um, one thing that I did towards the, yeah, it was the end of the first year of the pandemic, when we were all just so isolated, um, I convened this little Zoom group of people from the music world, composers, performers, another fellow critic, conductor, a director, um, who I knew I wanted to know better, and we just created a, a sort of secret Santa group where we just, we were assigned to each other and just to say, like, <coughs> share one piece of music that you're really excited about, or a song, you know, and, and make it a gift to this person, and it's an anonymous gift. And then we sort of got together and we made a playlist of all the songs, and it was such a fun thing to do, and it was a great springboard for conversation. Um, at the New York Times um, in, in 2021, I started what I hoped would become a little a series that was also based on the idea of swapping songs, where I invited people from completely different walks of life. So chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov or Rene Redzepi, you know, the Michelin star chef of Noma in Copenhagen, to, to sort of to talk about music, but also to just s start with a, s a swapping song. So I would offer them one piece of music that for me felt like what their craft and their work was about and asking them to give me something that they really wanted me to listen to and then have a conversation. And it wasn't just about sort of being curious what people are listening to, but also how they talk about it. And I, I'm very aware that there's something very privileged about being a critic who has a platform, especially if it's in the New York Times, that can sort of reinforce the idea that I think is so pernicious in classical music that knowledge breeds enjoyment which is just not true. And there are so many different ways of relating to sounds and to music. And they're almost always personal. And they often come out of our lived, often embodied experience. And it's really cool to just sort of bring yourself into conversation with somebody about their listening habits. Now, I find that usually when I do this, people often get really self-conscious. And I think that's a shame. But, um, but it's, it's really a fun thing and worth doing. So I think, you know, what, what I hope to leave you with, you know, the idea that we are better listeners if we assume responsibility for the conversation and the concert as much as our, our own listening behavior, that we bring awareness to ourselves, including the inner chatter, the environment, the acoustics, the air filtration system, that we sometimes spend time with silence and that we listen adventurously and omnivorously to as much as possible, to things we don't already know we love. I think that those things are, you know, the things that we can do that get us to a listening culture that is not focused on retaining information, but on cultivating generosity. And I think that's something that we could all use more of. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? We have a couple of minutes, yeah.
That's beautiful, yeah. So I'm just going to summarize, so in case not everybody heard it, so um, the, the idea that maybe it's worth going to concerts by ourselves sometimes because we can we can absorb some of that inner static from our <laughs> companion, right? And and sometimes feel responsible for their reaction. I, I know that really well. And I mean, the, the years that I was a critic, you know, it, I always had, it was such a treat to be able to offer my second seat to, you know, a friend and I would take many, many people to concerts and operas. And But but it also, I sometimes realized it was a little exhausting because because I did feel responsible and, it, you know, and they brought this energy of theirs. and. And, and there was something about there's something about taking yourself on a date by yourself anyway, whether it's to a museum or a concert where, you know, you you can actually relish in just having your own experience. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? Um, well, how did the, how did you get into it as a as a film critic? Did you join uh, as a musician? Um, how did I become a music critic? Yeah. So I did study music. Um, I think I also you know I I always love talking about music to non-musician friends, you know, I, I would be the one who would sort of on a long car journey, I would, I mean, my husband talks about this, like, I made him listen to Mala 4 when we were, the first week we were dating, and I just talked him through everything I was hearing, and he was like, wow. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then I became a journalist, writing about other things, and then they sort of came together pretty organically, around the, around the time I became a mother, actually, when I needed something I could write about without traveling so much, and... Um, but the actual criticism was another step. So there was sort of, there's music journalism where, you know, you can profile people and, and do interviews, and I really enjoyed that. And the actual reviewing side was sort of a step into, you know, a zone that is not that comfortable to me of sort of opinion and, you know, and sometimes calling it as you see it, which can be uncomfortable. Um, but I then found that when I had to, and once I was clear about that the criticism to me was about discernment rather than judgment, than you know, negative judgment, then that it was a chance to help people hear what, you know, what I might have heard or to sort of figure out how one might want to listen to something like metal machine music arranged for chamber orchestra. Um, then it, I actually really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find a difference between listening to digital music as opposed to you mean that's recorded digitally or analog or? Analog, which you play on a record. Mm -hmm. Digital, it's on digital music with the fraction of a second where there's no sound. Or analog music is continuous. Yeah, so the, the question is about the sort of change in recording techniques and analog and digital. So I'm just going to be really honest and I have, you know, really, I, I've embraced the digital age just for the convenience, the portability, the, the fact that I don't have vast amounts of, of, of records um, on the shelf. But, but yes, I mean, I, I know every once in a while, I once had the privilege of interviewing Keith Jarrett in his home. He lives in a farmhouse in New Jersey. Um, and he has this listening room set up, you know, just to listen to records. And he played me something. And I mean, it was humbling to be like thrown into a sound that rich and that beautiful. And, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not, not a good example for um, indulging in those subtleties. Just spin off of what he meant with like, like guitars and woodwind and brass versus like synthesizer, like, you know, like a hip, um, like deep house, if you will. Like electronic instruments versus acoustic instruments? You know, I mean, that's a really interesting question because I, I think I... You know, and I do love rock and listen to a lot of pop and I listen to a lot of what for fault of another word is called world music, you know, music from other world traditions. And, and I am drawn, like, either there has to be a great voice or there has to be, um, not, that, not that it has to be, but I, I do respond to acoustic instruments, I think, most powerfully. Um, but I also, like, love a lot of digital, I mean, th there are some incredible things that you can do. Also in the world of extended technique, you know, composers now play with, these sound effects where people play, for example, the violin just running the bow across the wooden shoulder of the violin. So you just get like, just like a little, you know, it's like as if you're rubbing your, your pants now, you know, and, and creating symphonies out of these white noise things. And again, like if you, if you just embrace the chance to sensitize your ear to, to, to the qualities of a different sound, 
then then you know you can the worlds can open up to you and it can be really interesting. And then you can hear the things. And I mean, the, the thing that I would sort of say, and then we have to go, is that it's also just worth going into the unknown and the uncomfortable so you can come back to the things that you love and just sort of hear them with you know, fresh ears as well. Thank you.